Okay, let's talk about the Panasonic Lumix S5. I've taken way too long to do this review. So long, in fact, that Panasonic have released a new model, the S5 Mark II. So is this review too late? No, this is still a great camera, and with the number of people trading in the S5 to get the S5 II, you can pick up some absolute steals on the used market. I'm only gonna have this camera for a few more days because I'm one of those people upgrading, and I'll explain why later. So if I don't make this review now, I never will. I can't show you the camera right now because I am filming on it, but I promise you there's a lot of B-roll coming up in this video where you can see it in action. So for the past two years or so, when people have asked me for a camera to preserve their travel memories, this has been the one I've been recommending. So what better way to review a camera for traveling than to take it traveling? None. So let's go. For Easter, we decided to treat ourselves to a staycation in sunny South End. Now, South End is the home of the world's longest pleasure pier, although as we found out in the excellent pier museum, the pier actually served as a proper pier, allowing boats to dock even at low tide, and that's why they built it initially. So, I want to start talking about the particular body and lens combo I am using. Everyone says, Pick the lens you want first and then get a body to go with it. And that's exactly what I did here. Now, at the time of release, the 20 to 60 millimeter range was quite unique. Sure, now we have things like the 20 to 70 G lens from Sony because everyone's now beginning to realize just how awesome a wide to normal zoom lens is for general photography. Panasonic must have realized this before anyone else and that the, and that the years of exposure of smartphones which have wide lenses had gradually shifted what people considered to be normal from 50 years ago. A wide end of 20 mm gives you not only the ability to capture large scenes and buildings from close-up range but also gives you the sense of exaggerated perspective we have all grown to prefer. The 60 mm long end is just slightly longer than what until recently was considered normal and this is super useful for those times when you do want to focus on some smaller area or compress the perspective down a street, for example. Which brings me to the other aspect of this lens, which is just how well it performs. Now, when this lens came out, it caused quite a stir because of the 20 to 60 millimeter range. In fact, Chris and Jordan, link below, did a really in-depth review on it. Despite it being a kit lens, the 20 to 60 is flawlessly sharp on the 24 megapixel sensor on the S5. Now, a lot of cameras tend to come with slow lenses as a kit lens, which is fine because as we'll see later, 3.5 to 5.6 on a full frame camera isn't exactly slow. The problem is that manufacturers usually cheap out on these kit lenses, not only making them slow, but also just really, really bad in general. In fact, one of the main reasons to ditch the kit lens wasn't the speed, but just how sh** and blurry the photos came out. Well, you won't have that issue with this kit lens. I was stunned by how sharp it is. Even if you pixel peep, you can see that this lens out-resolves the 24 megapixel sensor. Take a look at the MTF charts of this lens versus some premium lenses from Canon and Sony and you will see that this is no ordinary kit lens as it outperforms so-called upgrade lenses costing much more than this. The 20-60 peaks at about 2250 lines per picture height in the center down to about 900 at the edge. This compares with the Canon 24-105 f4L lens which peaks at only 2000 in the center and drops to 1250 at the corner. The Canon 24-70 f2.8 lens, which is an ultra-premium zoom lens, gives us, wait for it, the same 22-50 in the center and 1250 in the corner. And this is why I say this has to be one of the best values in photography today. Because remember, you aren't even paying the retail price for this. You are getting this amazing lens for basically free with your new camera. I also want to touch on the speed of this lens. People will see 3.5 to 5.6 and think this is a poor lens, but I think this is just as a result of slow kit lenses traditionally just being generally bad. If you think of the F number, it's actually perfect for travel photography, as any larger and you're going to start to get too little depth of field. There's no point going to an exotic place, posing in front of it and then obliterating the exotic background with bokeh. You will need to stop down anyway, and you would have spent the whole day car carrying around a giant f.2 zoom lens for nothing. Especially as they seem to be no sharper anyway. 
If you look at some of these photos where my model is posed in front of something interesting, you could argue that the background is already too blurred out as it is. I think the aperture of this lens is already as large as anything you would want to take with you on holiday. The only downside of this lens is that if you want to take pictures at night, then you will end up with either dark or grainy pictures. But that is going to happen anyway, even with an f4 zoom lens for twice the price. If you want to take photos after dark, then you are really looking at using a fast prime, which is another concept altogether, and I won't go into that here. Next, I wanted to talk about the autofocus, because this camera still uses contrast detect autofocus, while pretty much every other brand has moved over to phase detect autofocus. Contrast detect autofocus works by analyzing the image, moving the focus slightly, and then analyzing again. If the second image was sharper than the first, then it does the process again and moves further. But if the second image was less sharp than the first, then the focus direction reverses and the process repeats until the camera decides that it has achieved optimum focus on the desired point. Now, obviously, this process sounds like just trial and error, and it sort of is, which is why contrast detect autofocus is known for its slow speed and also the hunting, which is what happens when a camera doesn't know whether to focus out in front or to focus behind, and that's why you get this pulsing effect. Now, this is particularly bad for video because a contrast detect system doesn't know it's in focus unless it, fo unless it first changes the focus, and this is why every now and then in video, the camera loses focus to check itself. So there's definitely some downside to having only a contrast-based system. However, Panasonic has developed this over the years and years, and the algorithms for deciding if an image is in focus or not have gotten actually quite good, even for video. I'm recording this on my S5 right now and using a 20 to 60 millimeter and I bet the focus has been good enough this whole time even though I've been waving my hands in the air a lot. Now for still pictures it's a totally different story. This camera focuses so quickly and so accurately that it nearly never misses when taking still photos even in continuous autofocus mode which is where I have it the whole time. Take a look at a sample of the photos taken and even zoom into 200% and you will see that this camera basically nailed focus every time. Now there's one caveat to this which is in most travel photos the subject is relatively still be it a building, a person and this is why I'm recommending this as the ideal travel camera. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this for wildlife or sports where the subjects are constantly moving I haven't tested this situation personally, but other reviewers have, and they say it's not too great at that. While we're on the topic of autofocus, I want to let you in on, on a little secret setting on this camera, which no one else seems to have mentioned, but which gets me sharp in-focus photos every single time. Modern cameras and lenses are so sharp that the old method of half-pressing the shutter to lock focus and then pressing to fully take the photo simply doesn't work anymore. Any microscopic movement of your subject or your hands in the time between locking focus and fully pressing the shutter button is going to mean that either the subject is no longer in focus, has moved, or your hand has moved, and I think this is the reason a lot of people end up taking blurry pictures. Panasonic is the only camera brand which has implemented what I like to call a hair trigger on the shutter. To activate it, go into the main menu, while in photo mode, Go to the gear icon and select focus shutter priority and set this to focus for both AFC and AFS. Then go to page 2 on the same menu and go to half press shutter and toggle that on as well. Now when you want to take a picture, just touching the shutter button focuses the camera onto your selected focus point, be it face or eye detect, and then as soon as it's focused it instantly takes the shot. These two settings result in perfect focus every time, and I don't understand why more cameras don't have something similar. The other thing that Panasonic has kept, which other manufacturers have lost, is the dedicated drive mode dial. When I am out traveling, I very frequently have to switch between single shot, burst mode, and self timer, because these are the kind of pictures you take when you're traveling. The dedicated knob makes it quick and easy to switch between these modes, on other cameras, you usually have to press a button before using a wheel or a joystick to select your mode, and this wastes a tremendous amount of time. This could mean the difference between getting a shot or missing the shot. What makes it worst is that most of these competing camera bodies have space for it, but I suppose they've chosen to save cost and put it as a button instead. 
Now, Sony has done it on the top of the uh, A1 cameras, but none of their cheaper models which have it, which proves to me it's a cost-cutting measure. I say cheaper, but all of these models are more expensive than the Panasonic S5, by the way. This leads me to a wider discussion about the ergonomics and button placement on the S5. Here, all of the buttons just make sense and everything is where it should be. The general build quality is top of the line and everything feels sturdy and well built. The body is weather sealed, which comes in very handy if you live in a country like I do where it rains half the time. For me, a weather sealed body is an absolute essential. I have been caught already in the rain a few times with this camera and actually on this trip and it survived just fine. These three buttons on the top next to the shutter release are in fact the settings that you would use most frequently, especially when using manual settings like I do. Fuji cameras have a very similar layout, but to access similar controls on a Sony camera requires multiple steps or going into the menu. If you like to use back button autofocus, which I don't recommend by the way, the autofocus button is located right where your thumb rests. I find a little joystick a bit fiddly and hard to use, but I hardly use that anyway. I just use a touchscreen whenever I want to select a focus point and it's much quicker, if a little bit less accurate. The power switch is located in a place where it can be accessed using either your thumb or finger, depending on how you're currently holding the camera. During the course of this trip, recording myself taking videos and photos with the S5, I have learned that I actually use my thumb quite a lot to, um, to press a shutter button, which is something I wasn't even aware of before. I was doing it, but I wasn't aware I was, I was doing it. How can I make it look like it's real? Alex? Finally, this camera has a flip out screen, which you can face forward and is essential for taking selfies. There are snobs out there who insist that a real camera must have a tilting screen and not a flip out screen. But in this day and age, selfies are an important part of travel and to me, this is essential on the camera as well. 10 seconds. I need to change that to three seconds. I need to change that to three seconds, don't I? Just three shots after 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Let's go tip it up and get that. At this point, I should probably mention that the S5 has two SD card slots, which you might think is a waste of time until you experience your first SD card failure. This happened to me on a recent trip to Cornwall this year. On the third day of my trip, and if I were not recording simultaneously on the two SD cards, I would have lost everything. Dual SD card slots are not just for wedding photographers. I took some pretty good photos on that trip and I would have been super annoyed if I'd lost them. Now it's time for the part you've all been waiting for, a discussion about image quality. I know that over the years, images from smartphones have gotten better and better and better, but they are still nowhere near what you can get for a proper camera, especially a full frame camera like this one. I have a Galaxy S22 Ultra, which is probably the best camera, camera on a phone you can get in 2023, and the pictures from that look bad compared to the pictures from the S5. Pictures from my phone actually have very little detail and have a very processed look, um, which might look nice, but doesn't really reflect reality. The only exception to this was the pro mode on the S23 Ultra, which saved raw files and exposed a lot of pro settings. These actually look pretty damn good, and, but it takes a lot of time adjusting settings using a touchscreen, which kind of, defeats the, kind of defeats the purpose of having a smartphone camera in the first place. So that's all I have to say about the S5. I've had it for nearly two years and it's gone with me on several trips and it's never let me down. So why would I trade in mine after I've just spent all this time recommending the S5? Well, it's because I make videos for YouTube and the improved autofocus is going to make a big difference to me. I'm also looking forward to better performance from my Sigma lens. The focusing element on my Sigma 35mm f1.2 is really large and the pulsing action created by the contrast detect autofocus is quite noisy and disconcerting. When I had that same lens on my Sony A7 III, there was none of that. I'm hoping that the phase detection on the S5 Mark II fixes that. 
Those are the main reasons, but I'm also looking forward to the dual SD card slots, which means quicker writing and clearing of the buffer. I'm also interested in embedding my custom lots into my photos, so I don't have to, to, to do a lot of processing afterwards if I don't want to. Kind of like Fuji. So how much is all this goodness going to cost? Well, I'm looking at prices on park cameras because this is where I buy and sell all my gear. And used prices for the body start at $7.99, going up to about $850 for a body in excellent condition. There's even one with 53 shots. Not sure how this is, is even possible, but there we go. You're also going to need a 20 to 60 millimeter lens, and unfortunately, they're not selling them together, even though they came together with the S5 originally in many of the uh, combo configurations. But these lenses are going for bargain prices, ranging from 160 pounds. So your total is going to be less than a thousand pounds for this absolutely brilliant combo of full frame camera and travel lens. Shout out to Park Cameras, they are not sponsoring this video. In fact, the only sponsor here is myself. Thank you for watching and I sure hope that this video helped you. If you want to support me, the best way you can do that right now is by clicking like and subscribe and by watching some of my other videos so I can build up my subscriber number and watch time. Some of my videos have thousands of views and if only a few of you clicked like and subscribe, that would help me out a lot. So bye for now and I'll see you in the next one.